Amen. You may be seated. All right, I'm going to first of all invite up um, Christian to come and explain how those in the house and explain how those in the house, you have a QR code to get the free ebook, and those online, you have another QR code so that there won't be. It's the same book. We're not, we're not, we're in church. We're not, we're not playing games. All right. In fact, there are more options for the people online to buy the fiscal copy. All right. So he will explain. Yes. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor Poju. Yes. I am from Pastor Howe and Pastor Lee's team. I know I don't look like it, but I really am. (laughs) And um, so... So Pastor Han Pastor Lee, they have written a book and uh, all the teachings and many more are all in the book. And for all of you online, uh, there's a link in the, on, on, online, a QR code you can scan and it will bring you to a special page that we have created for Pastor Poju's uh, conference and it will get you a good price and also we made sure that we can ship into all the African nations because we understand that many of you are streaming in. But for everybody in this room, everybody who is present in this room, uh, we know you made an effort to come here. You flew here. You drove here. Some of you many hours. And that's a lot of effort. And because of that, Pastor Hao and Pastor Lia would like to match your effort. And we're going to give to all of you the e-book free of charge because... You have paid with your effort to come here and there's a QR code on the screen and we can also flash the QR code after the session so it's for you to download. So yes, enjoy, read the book and uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm done. All right, uh, for the question and answer. Okay, the QR code. All right, so for the question and answer, there'll be four stands. Where are the microphone stands, please, ushers? Oh, oh, they're not stands. They're people, Uh, so you have to be far apart. Here, where are the people here? All right, okay. You should have put stands so that they, the people will know where to come to. Get four stands so they know where to come to. All right. Four microphone stands so they know where to come to. Okay. So I will invite Pastor Lea, Pastor Howe, and Pastor Garrett. All right. Please... All questions must be based on what was shared here. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you have doctrinal battles in Nigeria, it's not their business. <laughs> it's what was shared in this conference that they are answering. And if you ask any question that is not based on that, I'm on ground here as a local to intercept your question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's start. Who, who will go first? Who is going first? You are shy. All right, the, the gent, the lady, you can get up. Ask a question there. Praise God. Yeah. This is my question is, this news that I've been brought up wait, in wait, the wait, church. Wait, 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 introduce yourself. My name is Uche Nwachuku. I work in altar call departments. Okay. Yeah. I want to know, this news that are being trained in the church, are they also allowed to work in the church and as well do circular job in the society? like accountants, bankers, or any other job in the organization. Thank you. You got it? I'll go first? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, great question. Yes, of course, there is freedom. Um, so we have some youths who grow up and they become full-time in church. Um, a lot of them, um, they are volunteers, so they have a full-time job as accountant and business people and uh, engineers, um, and, and they still serve in church. And uh, that is wonderful because they can learn the skills, the expertise of the world, um, and then they can help the church progress. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. But first of all, Pastor Pojo, I just want to thank you. Everybody, this again is an example of empowering. I am so impressed and uh, have full respect. Him giving up his time, giving up the mic in his own conference. <laughs> Most pastors will say, now is my time to speak. But Pastor Pojo, again, is almost like Jesus saying, let me decrease and let um, the guest ministry increase and let them have more airtime. I have never had this experience before. Thank you. All right, I, I, I have a question I want to ask. Um, <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, I know churches in Singapore, um, so I know that this um, what's the word now? This vision that you have for the youth, this um, drive here. How did you come into this um, understanding and passion for youth? What, what, what really? Because that's not the template for a successful ministry. So, and, and it's a very courageous decision to go in that direction because, I mean, youths are less financially so, uh -huh. so what did you see that made you say, look, we're going in this direction? The Lord spoke to my wife <laughs> and I obeyed. Uh, you can add on, but, but it is true, it is true, because this is, we laugh, but, but God spoke to me to be a pastor, to plant a church. God, God spoke to her about generations, and as we talked about earlier, um, her vision to me seems to be bigger, greater than my vision. And, and I saw the hand of the Lord upon what she's doing. And, as she, and, and God gave her good success and, and breakthroughs. And I came behind her to structure, uh, to put in systems and organize it for that. And together, together. So, so we are known for being a generation's church and we are known for being a strong church. The strong church part is what God gave to me, the blueprint, that not just any church, but a strong church. But how do you build a strong church? Through generations. So, I'm so grateful. Please don't leave me. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, I think for us, like what Pastor Hao said, we, it's, it's really a marriage that was really uh, enlivening for both of us, the vision that we had. And I think that if left on our own, I would still have served God. If we haven't come together, he would have also served God. But because God brought us together, that's why it became a lot more powerful uh, my heart for youth and generations and his whole mindset about strong church. And I always tell him that um, if he didn't come behind and give the structure and the systems and all of it, we would just be a very passionate hippie church. You know, full of young people. Look, I mean, look at the way. I, like, they're all going to be like this. So, yeah, so thank God God put us together. Answering your question, Pastor Bojun, youth, uh, I have always loved youth from young. Uh, I come alive around them, so you could say that maybe it's a gift, it's a grace. Uh, I love them. I love kids. I love youth. But then again, that's just passion. 
But over the course of our ministry lives, we have invested in so many young people. And Pastor and I, we've gone through a lot of heartbreaks, a lot of betrayals. So in that season, you really start to question, are they worth it? <laughs> Do we really want to keep on doing this? Because you think to yourself that maybe if you raise youth in your, in your, in your house, you, you bless them, you grow them, that they would somehow stay loyal, truthful, sincere, but that's not the case. Um, so that was the passion I had. But then all these heartbreaks, there will always be people who break your heart. And then I came to a point where I questioned myself, is it worth it? Uh, do I still talk about generations when we've been so hurt, so broken? And that's when I make a decision and say, yes, I'm called to the young people and I'm going to keep raising generations. And that's the moment when the passion becomes a conviction. A passion that is tested becomes a conviction. So I can only tell you that I do run on emotions, but it's a lot more in conviction and yeah, the calling. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right. I, I'll take a question online because uh, it's reoccurring. Now, let me put the con- question in context now. Um, so from the onset, it looked like you caught in early on youths. All right. From at least fairly from the onset of your ministry, you, you caught into the dream. But there are churches where um, uh, people have gotten old. Sorry. There are churches where people have grown old, all yeah. right, okay, and there's a pastor now who now says he's getting a vision for the youth, so for example, the congregation members will be looking at their pastor, that are you about to overthrow us here, so somebody is asking, those who are above 45, now, but the, but the context is that in this context, it's not like they have active youth. So what they want to do now is to have a paradigm shift. And in that paradigm shift, right, the people who are 45 and above will feel threatened. Okay? And um, so how do you manage that? I'll get started. And yes. Pastor Garrett, you can chime in from the younger generation. Uh, that is such a good question. I'm so glad that I have the time and the opportunity to bring to balance what I've just talked about. Of course, when you invite Pastor Leah and Pastor Hao, we are always going to champion you and tell you about young people. But there is a balance. So first of all, um, this is our third year in this conference. So for those of you who have not um, heard the sessions from us on 2021, 2022, they are all online, all right, in Covenant Nations uh, YouTube. And, and it brings into balance because one of the message, oh yeah, I, I think I asked our team to put it up. One of the message you need to listen to to bring to balance is this one, the power of a three-generation church. Because I, I speak about how it's not just about the young, but it's also about the middle age. It's also about the older senior citizens. And they come together, and when three generations are strong and empowered, your church will be phenomenal. So, coming back, um, so we, we have, as the senior pastor, we have to teach, we have to encourage, we have to in, persuade the whole church, including the older people, to support the young people. In every way, you have to mobilize them. So we do have about almost a thousand older people in our church, 45 and above. Um, So a lot of them are parents. A lot of them are grandparents. And for parents and grandparents, the greatest joy is to see their kids and their grandkids on fire for Jesus. So I got to be honest with you. They say the music is too loud. <laughs> they sit at the back so that they're not close to the subwoofers. They, they say I have cataract. It's too dark. You know, and the lights are always flashing. Some of them call us HOGC, Heart of God Club. <laughs> but 
so yes, there are some, not a lot, but there are some who say, this is not for me. And, and we say, God bless you. That's why God has different churches in the city, different expression. If you feel you can grow in another church, God bless you. We are friends. But there are a lot of them, especially when they are, they are, their kids are in church. They say, I love it. I love the energy. I love the passion. So they are here. And now, because we need, need the parents to drive the kids to church. We need the parents to cook. You know, the key to a youth revival is pizza. So, so we need the parents to cook and food and have pizza. So, so they open up their homes. So, the, yeah, so they are all in into this vision. And, and also, finances you were talking about. It is true. A youth church has no money. A, a youth church, the youths, they eat like the locusts in Exodus, in the plague. <laughs> when they come, the food is all gone. So they not only don't have a lot of money, they consume. And so when Pastor Lee and I first started, um, we say it like this, we feel like we are parents with 10 kids. It's tough, right, as a parent with 10 kids. But the kids grow up. And the kids grow up to become successful business people like Pastor Garrett, lawyers and doctors. And they understand what it means to be poor. And so now they give. And now they are committed. They say, put, put the burden, the financial burden on us. We will carry the burden for our younger brothers and sisters. So yes, initially it was tough. But you go through that and God will bless you. I'm not sure if you want to add. And, and just to add on to that a little bit, um, being in church for more than close to 30 years, I see how generations come a full circle because now I'm in my 40. I'm 40 this year. Uh, I, my son is at eight years old. And just last weekend, he was playing the drums for the hard kids. Uh, he was serving on the photography team. And so even in, in my 40s right now, I see the need for Heart of God Church to reach young people because in the end, my own children is benefiting and they can grow up in the same revival that I grew up in. So as a parent, when you're older, you see that, hey, we need to invest in the young people because my children need to encounter God in the same way as well. And also speaking from a younger person perspective, you know, Pastor Hal talked about the older people, they help cook, they help drive the kids. You know, I speak to many of the young people and they say, we need the older people in the church. You know, they are not proud, arrogant and said, oh, we can do this by ourselves. But no, they say that we need, we need help. We know we got no money. We know we got no houses. So they will go to the older people, uncle, auntie, can you open up your house so that we can connect groups in your house? So the younger people appreciate the older generation as well. All right. Before I go back to the congregation, I want to ask, do you have a children's church? Do you, do you have a children's church? No. Yes, we do. we do. What's the age? You, at what age do they come to the adult church? <laughs> well, Maybe well. six months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's going <laughs> my, my kids grew up in children's church. So uh, we have children's church. Um, um, in fact, what's interesting was that Pastor Lear, when the church first started, Pastor Lear was the first children's church teacher, the first children's pastor. And so that's why she saw uh, that there were nine kids that were a little bit too old, misfits in children's church, because they were 11, 12 years old. And she saw us and she says, hey, we need to do something for them. If not, we will lose them. So that's why she formed the first teen cell or youth cell group. And that's where the youth grew. You know, it, it, the nine grew to the thousands that you see today. So honestly, from the beginning, Pastor has a great heart for children and youth. And until today, we still have a children's church. Of course, it meets the needs of the second generation of my children, uh, Pastor Christian's children, and all of them. But we also are intentional in our children's church to reach first generation Christians. Because we know we, just, we don't just want to have second generation Christians, but we want to reach first generation Christians with our children's church as well. All right, but the okay, but point I'm trying to make is I saw 10 year olds, 11 year olds in your services. So at, at what point did they come into the main church? The 10-year-old, 11-year-old, 
they are in the main church. Uh -huh. They are. So they are, when they are playing the drums, when they are on uh -huh. photography, they are in the main church. So they are integrated. Now, yes, we have a children's church for the four-year-old, uh -huh. the seven-year-old. That's where I'm going. We, and then we let them serve in the children's church. And then they come to serve in the main church. So if, when you come, you will see kids running the main church. The church is run by kids. Okay, last question. I, I follow up on this. So when you invited, I mean, you invite people, um, Pastor John Bever, Bishop Bloomer, the 11-year-olds listen to them? Yes. And they yes. understand them? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, 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 <laughs> all right. Question from that side, please. Yo, please. Yeah, the guy in the blue shirt. Praise, praise God. Yeah. My, name is, my name is Nelson. I'm from the Leading Edge Christian Center. My question is, with youth, there is usually um, the hunger for opportunities. You know, youth always want better opportunities. How are you able to manage influx of people, people you have invested in, discipled, and they want to take an opportunity in another country or another city away from your church? How, do, how, how does that, do you feel hurt by that? So how does that work? All right, so yeah, you what you're saying is that if you train youths, uh, keen on exploit, uh, well, exploiting opportunities that come their way. So after you have trained them, they can become so valuable that their talents are needed in bigger cities or in, big, or in other nations and that they leave and that uh, you get hurt by that. You get what? Hurt. Heartbreak, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, what was the question? Manage that. Huh? So the fear is if I invest in these people, they will become valuable and attractive. Like what he said, that the company wanted to hire him. Mm. Yes. So I think what he's suggesting is that so how do you in this part of the world, yes, yeah, they may take the... Other people want that. <laughs> yeah. uh, if it's a foreign company, he will be gone. I, I think... You, when you, Jesus says count the cost. When you invest in the lives of the young people, you must be prepared. You must have the right expectation that we sow into the young people, but not everyone is going to be grateful or be loyal. Um, and some might even backslide in the world. They learn the skills and they become successful in the world. And they forget about God, they forget about church. Uh, we have that. Um, but that must not stop you from doing what is right, doing what Jesus does. Jesus knows there's going to be a Judas. Jesus knows that nine out of ten lepers are not going to come back. But he still healed the one leper. He still loves them. He still, he does it. So, so we, we say it like this. When you give, don't remember. But when you receive, don't forget. So you need to have the right expectation. So I want to burst the bubble that we all have. Listen, if you want a church of 120 youth, you will have 10 Judas. Ouch. Jesus says the parable, you sow a seed into four kinds of ground, four kinds of heart. Out of four kinds of ground, how many are good ground? Only one. So out of four youths, if you have one, that's a win. That's Jesus' statistics. So honestly, for every one Pastor Garrett, we probably lost three who are no longer here. So you just have to keep doing it, and you do a lot. 
you minister to hundreds and you disciple thousands of you and then you will have the remnants yeah yeah that's awesome and I just want to share from my perspective as well because there were those that left like what Pastor and Pastor mentioned uh, but what made me say um, was really because I had a vision that God gave me a vision for the church a vision to be a pastor um, and that really kept me because you, you, in the Bible when Jesus called the disciples he said follow me and I'll make you fishes of men he didn't say follow me and I'll love you follow me and I'll comfort you, follow me and I will be there for you when you're sad, you know. But Jesus says, no, he gave the disciples a vision. Follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. So what happened for me, you know, I'm going to share my story a little bit tomorrow in the youth rally. Um, but it reached a point where I had an opportunity to go overseas to study and my parents really wanted me to leave the country four years overseas away from Heart of God Church. But I knew that that would mean that I will be away for four years, I will miss out on the opportunity to build the church, to grow in church, and I will compromise my destiny in God. But I dis so I made a decision, it, it, despite my parents being very disappointed with me, I said, no, I'm going to stay in Heart of God Church, I'm going to stay in Singapore, I'm going to give up a more prestigious education overseas, because I'm called to build the house of God. Please, and, all right, the gentleman in blue. All right, come. Why are you people coughing? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, to Pastor how? when you find the Judases, ah. do you allow them to infect the rest, or do you amputate them? Or do you... Yeah, so how do you deal with the Judases when you see them early? Do you just let them stay and potentially influence some others? Thank you. <laughs> that seemed to be the question that everybody is thinking about. <laughs> A lot of hurt pastors in this conference. I, I, I don't want to go deep because every case, every person is different. And I can't give you a general rule. Um, your leadership is different. Some of us needs to be stronger in our leadership. Some of us needs to be more loving in our leadership. So it's very hard to answer. In fact, it's even hard to label somebody a Judas. H how do you know this is a Judas or this is a prodigal son who will return? Only God knows the hearts of men and women and they are so young but at the same time don't be foolish as pastors don't be naive so so jesus says you know be wise as serpents and innocence as dove so so we are not saying that um we we allow you know, the Bible talks about a leaven that leavened the whole lamb and get one person infecting the good culture, the good people in our church. No, no, no. Then we as shepherds, we have to be a leader and make strong, tough decisions. But at the same time, um, we, we extend as much restoration and grace as possible. That's, that's yeah. Um. I think for us to feel a person is a Judas, the situation must have reached a very intense point and very <laughs> um, ferocious confrontations. Uh, but I, I think from another perspective in answering that question, um, for me, I like to always evaluate my leadership. And I think we are all pastors and we need to acknowledge that we are not perfect we are still very much a work in progress in terms of how we lead people. So for me, I have a principle in life is that for every occasion that calls for someone to be called a traitor or a Judas, it's obviously been very painful for us to be able to go to that stage. But I like to use pain for my own gain. I would like to use it to evaluate myself. And I always say, did I do anything wrong? Could I have done better? 
to avoid this in the first place. And if I think that I could have done better, then I would change because God has called us to be better leaders. Um, but if I felt like, you know, it's just you, it's your problem, then I would just like, okay, maybe that's you, I'm okay. But I like to evaluate, that's the first E. But the second thing I like to do is to expel whatever poison that has been entrenched or toxins in my heart in that, in that, in that situation. Because if you want to grow a healthy church, you have to be a healthy pastor on the inside. If your heart is tainted, um, your church is going to be tainted. So evaluate, expel. And the third thing is mostly in those cases when you call, with people are called Judas or make you feel like they're Judas, usually I don't think we can do very much about the person himself. And then in that case, I always go to the third E, which is to entrust the person to God. The Bible says entrust your enemies to God. And so I do that. The three E's are very important for me. It keeps me pure in serving God and it keeps me growing as a leader. We can never, you know, be perfect. So I like to grow. Yeah. All right, the lady. Um, yeah, no, okay. Yeah, no. Praise God. My name is Grace, and I work in the pastoral care unit. Um, my question is um, how do you deal with children and their parents, right? Parents that may not want to willingly give up their children, you know, for all of this. There's some parents that may just say, no, I don't want to give my child to you to train or something. How do you deal with those scenarios? Pastor Garrett talked about his parents, right, not wanting to allow him to travel overseas for the studies. How, you know, how did you navigate that scenario? Um, how... <laughs> Your parents are bad. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, um, I, I think the way we have led young people, I, I think we are very strong leaders and they are very young. And I, we must be very careful on how we frame things for them or how we get them to make decisions. Uh, they are so easily pliable in the hands of adults. So for me, I like to think that the approach would be for us, our style of leadership has always been to paint you the consequences if you make this decision and paint you the consequences if you make this decision. That's how it's discipleship is like. We help you to see consequences and you have to make your own decision. And in a scenario like this, what we would do is possibly get Pastor Garrett to say, right, so this is this is where the tension is with where your parents' counsel is. The situation is that if you go, this and this is going to happen. But if you stay, this is going to happen. You know, you have to balance the whole thing. Consequences, consequences, and you will have to see which one you want. And the choice is yours. We don't make choices for them. They will have to make their own choice. Does that explain it? Yeah. Does that explain it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that... Um Everyone has an individual calling. Um, it's not dependent on your parents. You know, Pastor Howe has a great phrase. He says that God has no grandchildren. And um, that every child has a unique call that God has for his or her life. And, and as a parent, first and foremost, we must understand that, that we are just stewards of our children's life. And that our goal is to make them successful in whatever God has called them to do. And of course, if we can convince the parents to see that, that would be beautiful. But if not, the parents should, I, I personally feel, should not, com, should, not be a com, should not compromise a child's calling in God. You know? And if the child feels like, I want to be on fire, and it reaches a point where they have to make their own decisions, their own convictions. And of course, like what Pastor Leah said, we will guide the children on how to have the wisdom to, lead, to guide them to relate to their parents with still honor and respect but still living out their godly convictions. Yeah. All right, I want to ask you, Pastor Garrett, um, how do your parents feel about what you are doing now? I would love to say that, um, okay, my, my, parent, my family is a whole long story by itself. <laughs> uh, I come from a broken family. My, my, parents was, um, my parents were divorced when I was a young kid. Um, my mom was a single mom. Um, she was a Christian. She, was, she, she is a Christian. Um, she wanted me to go to church. But one day at 16, I told her, Mom, I want to be a pastor. 
and she got upset. You know, she says, you know, I've raised you up to have a successful career. Why are you throwing it all away to be a pastor? So she was really upset with me that I wanted to be a pastor, even though she was a Christian. And uh, so I, you know, I, that, that's why when I, she wanted to send me overseas, I believe one of the reasons was so that I would not be so distracted by church and God. Uh, yeah, but the truth is until now, she's, she's a Christian, but she has never said that she's proud of me. She has never asked me about what I do in church. Um, but, you know, I, I've grown, reached a point in my life where I learned that I'm not living for the... I mean, I love my parents, I love my mom, I respect her, but I don't live for her affirmation, but I live for God's affirmation. I'm not living according to her standards, but I'm living according to God's standards. Uh, just uh, to wrap this up real quickly, and we can move on, is the, uh, we, that's individual, but as a church, as an organization, we try our best to partner with the parents. So every year, once a year, we have Academic Excellence Weekend. In Asian culture, studies and, and doing well in school is very important. Um, and so we have academic, academic excellence where they can say, oh, my kids come to church and their grades, their results are better. And then it's an open house because people are suspicious of what they do not know. People fear the unknown. And a lot of parents, they have never come to church before, um, but the kids have been coming. So when we have an open house and they come and they see, oh, the pastors are not monsters. <laughs> they are hanging out with good young people and a lot of them are, are more open to their kids spending time in church. And, and just one thing to add with that, you know, we reached a lot of parents uh, who are not Christians. So their kids come to church. So a lot, we have a lot of parents in our church and they're in our church because the kids brought them to church. Yeah. So uh, it's upside down in our church. It's not the parents bringing the kids, but the kids bringing the parents. So every time we have the Academic Excellence Weekend, it's a great time to win the parents and many of them stay in church, give their lives to Jesus. That's a powerful idea. Madam, I will call you. You can come. You come, 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 come. Yeah. Yeah, you can come. So after this, I need a Gen Z question. Let's practice what we have been preaching. Are, are you Gen Z? You don't, you're not Gen Z now. Look, look at your hand. <laughs> you're not Gen Z. Uh, ask. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Pastor Poju and Pastor Hal. Pastor Lia, thank you very much. So my question is this, that you actually seem, that's to Pastor Hal and Pastor Lia, you seem to know a lot about details of people that is their personal lives. How are you able to keep up with the constant updates without burning out? Because you actually also make yourself available and even like you travel over to attend maybe their graduations. How do you still, how do you manage all of this without burning out? And can I have some more questions, please? Okay, sir, thank you very much. Okay, so I have one more question. When you, it's still about the children, when you are trying to engraft them into service, how do you deal with maturity in their decision-making process? Because children can be quite young and I feel like they might not know exactly what they want. How exactly do you help them in their decision-making process? Thank you very much, sir. I, I think the question, the second question we can answer real quick. I've shared it. It's about inviting, including, involving them. And in that journey and process, you disciple them. And when you disciple them, they get mature. Not everyone, but a lot of them will grow in maturity. So that's the second question. The first question... Um, that's why we have five SPs, so that we all don't burn out. You know, I think one thing that I really admire about... Pastor Ha and Pastor Lea is that I've seen them from day one just loving the young people and I've seen them, their hearts being broken, disappointed, but they still do it. And I, I want to encourage some of you here is that the young people that you lead are seeing you. 
And I was just growing up, I was just so amazed by the hearts of Pastor Ha and Pastor Leah. And I'm so inspired that I wanted to be like them. That, to, that despite heartbreaks, despite challenges, to still keep loving people, keep loving young people, they were my role models. They, are, they, they set the example for my life. And uh, like what Pastor Leah shared earlier on, the three E's, it's more than just a teaching, but I seen her live that out. And, and honestly, one thing that really helped me growing up was Pastor and Pastor Leah were very real to us. They didn't hide the problems away from us. They, they, shared their, their, they shared the problems in the church. They shared um, the disappointments, their heartbreaks. And with that, we learned to catch their hearts. We learned what to do when they, they, you face disappointments in life. You learn that ministry is not just a bed of roses. And it grew me and discipled me to be a leader I am today. Amen. All right, I just, I just our friends from Ghana who came all the way from Ghana. Do you have any question? I'll, I'll open. G- Ghana, are you Ghanaian? <laughs> are, are you are you from Ghana? All right. So where is the Ghanaian crew? Okay, that's right. Okay then. Uh, okay. One question because the way you're opening the book, <laughs> it's like you have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Poju and the team. Okay, so my name is Asel Benedict Kojoyia. I'm from Ghana and <laughs> from Ruhi Church. And I'm a youth pastor. I want to find something from um, Pastor Leah and Pastor Howe. From the presentation, Pastor Leah made us to understand. You have youth. You also have the package of the mess up that comes with their blessings. I want to find out that cultural diversity is something that goes along with grooming and training as one of the factors you must consider. And we are trying to learn from the Asians, which are different cultural dynamics. I would just want to find out for them, what are some of the methods they used to groom the youth? That's the first one. To adjust them to the new church culture and how to factor cultural diversity in this grooming and training for the youth drive. Thank you. Culture is a very interesting uh, concept. Culture, it can be an ethnic culture, a culture of a country. It can be a culture of a church. Um, it can be, a, and of the best, is biblical culture. It doesn't matter whether you are Western, you are white, you are Asian, you are African. Yes, they're all different. Uh, but you, culture is engineered. It doesn't happen naturally. So we see ourselves as cultural engineers. We shape the culture. But you shape the culture not just with the microphone and on the platform, but it's individual. You see, individually, we don't have a culture, but individually, we have convictions. And so if you can get every single youth to have the same biblical convictions, when the youths come together, the convictions become the culture. So a culture can be bad. A culture can be unbiblical. Or the opposite, a culture can be good, can be biblical. And we have to shape them. When we first started, we have maybe 50 young people. And 48 of them has very bad culture. Maybe two or three has the culture that we want. So we begin to work on the two 
and then get the two to influence one more and then one more and then one more after a few months maybe 10 and 40 and then you work on them individually individually all the time the Lord gave me a verse when I was very discouraged with the culture of our church of our young people we call them the nine stones not a compliment it is out of frustration <laughs> and the Lord gave me one verse it says talking about King David and Saul it says that the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker and the house of David grew stronger and stronger and that's culture so when I look at the young people I see the house of David grow stronger and stronger every week as I preach every week every day as I disciple 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 and now from 10 we have 20 then we have 30 and soon the good culture will overpower the bad culture and then some of them in the bad culture are unhappy and then they leave which is even better <laughs> because then your good culture gets stronger and stronger and stronger but it takes time it takes years but when you have a good culture then it builds momentum it's a spiral up so culture is very important very good question all right there's a person right at the back you've been putting up your hand that, yeah that person there you tried I thought the person was doing a selfie since for almost five minutes yeah no 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 behind that pillar yeah in black yeah thank you um, can you can you can you come out of the pillar so we can see your face so my name is Joe are you a Gen Z that's all no are you a Gen Z Aha, come out, come. That's, I, I knew, the way you put up your hand, I knew that. That this was a young person. Huh? All right, you can ask. Okay. Um, my name is Joel. Um, I actually have two questions. <laughs> Yeah, Alpha, you can ask two questions. So, um, my first question, for children like us, how do we make sure that we, um, people recognize us and we also get to, um, to be recognized so that our generation won't fall? And my second question is, so in Nigeria, before in my church, before people can, before children can um, go to the big church to start doing um, things or start operating things, um, you have to get to a certain age. And um, there are advantages and disadvantages of that because if you're in a big church, there are some things that the pastor is saying that some children, children cannot hear. So how do we strike the balance between that? <laughs> All right, you are saying there are some things in the adult church that children shouldn't hear. Is that what you're saying? Children cannot. That the pastor is saying that. Pastor likes or children cannot understand. Cannot understand, okay. All right. All right, so your question is how do you get recognized, first one, in the church? So. How do you get recognized? in church as a young person yes first of all i want to clap for you for being so brave to stand up among so many pastors and ask a question you are a champion already the bible says in uh, timothy let the youth be an example in purity in your faith in all that you do how do you get recognized um, it is not abilities it is not performances it is your maturity 
It is your character. It is your faithfulness. So when you are, you know, in, in, in our church, we, we have this term called MIA. Is it familiar for you? Missing in action. So we say, don't go MIA. If you are always present, not just in the services, but you are serving, you are cleaning the church, you are faithfully building the church, um, people will see you. People will recognize, who is this kid? So let your character shine. So it is not just being on stage. It is not just abilities. It is your character. And God, don't worry if you are just in the toilet, cleaning it, you are in the back room serving. God took David from the backyards of the, of the desert, tending sheep, and said, He is my chosen one. And in the same way, God will cause people to recognize you when you have a heart. Well, it, <laughs> you know, have you, you have seen what I talked about Pastor Garrett and the other two senior pastors, Pastor Charleston and Pastor Lynette? The, you see them at this point in their lives, but when they first started out, uh, Pastor Charleston, he stood out because he was, we, we, you know, we used to do cleaning of the church and we lead the young people to clean the church, hands on, really cleaning, toilet bowl, everything. And Pastor Charleston always cleans the cleanest toilet bowl and nobody could beat him <laughs> when he was cleaning the toilet, always the cleanest. So that tells me that that has something to do with where he is now at his level of life. He was very faithful to do whatever he was given. The Bible says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. You're going to wash toilet bowl, be the best at it. You've got to serve food, be the best at it. And the key is this, when you're doing all of this, your heart must be so pure that you're doing it to love God and to love people. I have never quite seen people who go around looking for promotion getting it. But if you would be faithful, promotion would chase you. You don't have to chase it. And Pastor Garrett here, when he was a little boy, he was just doing the trans... Okay, now you have projector and all of it, but in our dinosaur days, he used to just... Transparency, printed sheets on a projector, you know, just very hot mission, you, you flash lyrics when people were doing leading and stuff like that. He was excellent at it. He overqualified for his job. You have to work to the place where you're overqualified at with the level you are now. That's how you get promoted. Is that okay? That's how you get recognized. Yeah. But be bold like you are today. And you will be recognized too. Bold as a lion. Woo. Pastor, can I take a bit of time to share something oh, yeah. that I feel is in my oh, heart? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was in the green room talking to Pastor Fab and Pastor Godwin. And um, we were talking about a nation. And, um, and we talked about how you can change a nation, especially in, in the policies, in, in the way it is being run. And, and I'm not a politician um, and certainly don't intend to be one. But I believe that uh, we can change a nation by changing the hearts and the, the, the character of young people. Because the young people, they will grow up to be your future lawyers and business people and even statesmen and, and politicians. They will be the people who will run the businesses, the hospitals. They, they are the people. We know that. Um, but if we can put character, integrity, love for others, people, love for the country inside of them at a young age, in 20 years, they will be the people making the policies. So for me, when we say youth revival, yes, we want great youth revival, the youth are touched by the power of God. But I see the potential 
for social change. And it's in the young people. You see, it's hard to change a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old. They are quite set in their, in their ways. But if you can influence a 14, 15-year-old, and you have that relationship with them for the rest of your life, one day when they are 40 and they are business leaders and they are policy makers, and we could be in our 60s, but they will still come to us for advice, for mentoring, and, and we can be able to share about the Bible values to them. And they can make policies that will shape our country. So for me, I see not just youth revival. I see that if I change a youth today, I can change my nation in 20 years. And, and I want to conclude with this. Universities. Wherever you are, whatever city, there's a university. Focus on university revival. If you look at history, church history, almost every major revival is birthed from university. Pastor Poju, there are many university fellowships are where they are ignited, captivated, and they build powerful ministries out of university. But even in secular social justice movement, if you look into the history of the American civil rights movement, all the movement, it is always powered by university students who are idealistic, who caught a vision, and they want to make the world a better place. Right now, every future prime minister, president, Every future policy maker, movers and shaker, you know where they are? In university. So you may not be able to influence the current policy makers, but if you can have the opportunity to influence them now. So I feel so strongly in my heart that every church should focus on university students and if your location is close to a university, you should just reach out to the university, disciple them, because you will make a great difference in your nation in 20, 30 years' time. Thank you. I think that's the best way to close. That is a rounding up statement. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, you can feel the Lord said we should round up with that overview. Let's put our hands together for Pastor How Pastor Lear. We said we are rounding up. You are putting up your hand. Rounding up. I think we can we've come to an end. So, so let's put our hands together as we are allowed. So we are back here tomorrow. If your question wasn't answered, the next question and answer will be on Thursday. All right. So pray that your question, they will call you. Huh? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest upon us now forevermore. Amen. It was almost like saying I cover myself with the blood. The way some people were looking at me that I put up my hand, he didn't call me. <laughs>